For the ECU community, it's a great honor to host today a lecture that Mr. Ambassador will deliver on the topic of the European Union and Belarus relationships. Last time we met uh, with Ambassador in November 29. After the discussion, we will have an opportunity to participate in question and answer sessions where all of our students, colleagues, guests uh, will have a chance to ask uh, Mr. Ambassador all the questions uh, you will be interested in or uh, you, you are looking for an answer. So, His Excellency Ambassador Dirk Schubel was appointed for the position of Ambassadors of the European Union to Belarus in summer 29. Prior to that, he, uh, he led the work of the European Union External Action Service Russia Division. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I am extremely glad to be back uh, in uh, Vilnius at the European Humanities University. I apologize that it took two years for me to, to come back to you. But um, uh, as you have seen, there were so many things happening in, uh, in, in Minsk and, uh, and uh, in Belarus as a, as a whole. The, the, unfortunately, it was not possible to come earlier to you. Uh, I'm coming now uh, from Brussels. Yesterday evening, I came from Brussels. Uh, I should have come from Minsk. But why do I come from, uh, from Brussels? Because I have been asked to leave uh, Belarus uh, by the Belarusian authorities at the end of June uh, this year uh, for consultations. Uh, it means that um, the Belarusian side informed me uh, about four things altogether. First, they decided at the end of June that they would suspend their membership in the Eastern Partnership Initiative. Secondly, they decided to suspend the application of the so-called readmission agreement that we have enforced since 2019. And third, uh, they informed, uh, they asked me to leave uh, the country within 48 hours. So I had uh, two days time to pack my things. Not everything, because I have not been declared persona non grata, but to leave the country, uh, uh, to leave Belarus. And that is what I did. Um, at the same time, the Belarusian authorities recalled their ambassador in Brussels at the European institutions and uh, asked him to, for consultations to return to Minsk uh, as well. Unfortunately, the situation continues until, until now, and that is why I am working uh, from uh, Brussels as much as I can. Many things we have learned during the COVID crisis to do, to, to arrange ourselves. Video conferences, for instance, which were rather uh, rare before. Uh, so I am in daily contact with my team, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in Minsk, with the EU delegation there. Uh, all the rest of the colleagues are present until now. Um, and uh, I'm also in, in contact with my ambassador colleagues from the EU member states, but also with other uh, colleagues. Uh, also there we have regular uh, coordination meetings by video conference. And um, uh, so I'm doing my job as much as I can. And I'm traveling to the countries where there are many Belarusians, in particular since uh, August last year. And Vilnius, of course, is one of the main places where you have uh, uh, Belarusians uh, present because of you, because of the European Humanities University, because of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who is based here, and many others, and more and more uh, people. But it's not only uh, Vilnius. Uh, I have also been uh, regularly in Warsaw. There are also many um, uh, Belarusian uh, new diaspora, diaspora members and also opposition members, such as Pavel Latushko, and also members of the so-called Babariko team, um, and, uh, and uh, many, many others as well. Then you have, of course, Berlin with Svetlana Alexeyevich. You have Kiev as a major hub nowadays. Uh, I think the absolute highest number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Belarusian uh, civil society members that left the country is based now in Kiev. So we also plan to go soon to Kiev to, to pay a visit to them. Then you have Tbilisi. There are many in Tbilisi as well, and in many other places of the world. I was uh, two weeks ago in Copenhagen, and even in uh, Copenhagen you have quite a, quite a numerous uh, diaspora of, uh, of, of uh, Belarusians uh, who are organizing themselves there and who are, of course, uh, very, very supportive of the democratic uh, developments. Perhaps before I go into more detail, I will try to speak to you as openly as possible, so if I can ask you perhaps not to quote me if you, uh, after this, because it will be more interesting for you if I can tell you uh, a few things a bit more, more openly. Uh, so if this is agreeable to, to, to all of you, that would be appreciated. Um, so uh, today, our fifth package of sanctions was published. You might have uh, heard about this. This uh, fifth package consists of uh, 17 names and of 17 persons and 11 entities. 
Um, among them also Belavia, uh, the air company, uh, the national carrier of, uh, of Belarus. Uh, that is, uh, of course, an important step. And, um, and uh, we have also put uh, on this list a number of other players that have been involved in the so-called migration crisis that we have seen over the last few weeks and months. And I will tell you something about this uh, uh, later. But I wanted to first come back to the beginning of my, of my stay. Uh, I was nominated, as you rightly said, in, uh, in the summer of 2019. And I started my job on, uh, in early September 2019. And I went there with a lot of good intentions, with a lot of uh, positive emotions. Uh, our relationship had developed quite positively. And I was thinking that we can maybe uh, do something very positive uh, uh, in the future, not that we had any illusions about Lukashenko, nobody had, I think. But uh, we still thought that some uh, limited cooperation was possible. We were uh, in close negotiations on so-called partnership priorities, which were almost finalized. Unfortunately, we never got to, to fully finalize them. We, were, we had regular exchanges, we had a so-called coordination group in place, which met once every six months uh, on a relatively high level. Um, we had, uh, and in these meetings, by the way, uh, there were also civil society present. It was on the one side us, EU, on the other side the Belarusian authorities, and on the side you had uh, Belarusian civil society members. So there was even a kind of a dialogue taking place with the civil society at that time. Um, and uh, we also successfully concluded the visa facilitation agreement and the readmission agreement that I was just mentioning that Belarus uh, decided to suspend. Um, uh, uh, in, in the summer. So uh, I came there, I, I got a actually warm reception. Uh, the administration worked very well, everything was facilitated for my arrival, everything worked well, and we had good relations, uh, regular exchanges with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, visits to the countryside, meeting with local players, local both officials uh, and of course also civil society. Uh, human rights were always discussed openly, we had a human rights dialogue, all of this was existing. And then uh, things were unfortunately slowly deteriorating. The first uh, bad sign was already the parliamentary elections of November 2019, when uh, we had hoped that some more uh, independent figures would make it to the Belarusian parliament. But instead of the two ladies who were there until uh, November 2019, there was no one uh, new who was allowed to enter of the, from the independence side. So that was the first big dis disappointment. And the second big disappointment was, of course, uh, the COVID uh, handling by uh, Lukashenko and, and the authorities, or we can also call it no handling, non-handling, uh, because as you have seen, uh, Lukashenko even uh, in the beginning uh, made fun of the first victims of, uh, of COVID. Uh, when the first person died uh, in end of March 2020, he called uh, him an overweight man who didn't, live, who didn't lead a healthy life. Uh, so obviously when you say such things, uh, uh, you, you don't create trust in the population. Uh, no information was, uh, was uh, communicated. There's still, <clears throat> until today, no statistics how many people died in Belarus in 2020. Everywhere in the whole world you can see these figures. Maybe not in North Korea, I don't know, but you cannot see it uh, in Belarus either. So you don't know how many people died and that's why you cannot make any statistics uh, in, in which you can find out how many uh, additional uh, dead people were uh, caused by the COVID uh, pandemic. That's of course bad, um, and unfortunately this approach has not changed. The daily figures that you can see in the official statistics uh, by the Ministry of Health, you know, there's never more than 12 people dead per day, which if you look at the figures of the, in the neighboring countries is uh, unrealistic and of course not true. And also the case numbers are far below the, the real figures. With that, I think um, uh, Lukashenko lost trust in uh, quite some part of the population. Because until then, I had the impression that uh, Lukashenko had a kind of a social contract with the people, uh, or with many people. Uh, the people said, uh, people knew that he would kind of pretending to take care in, the social, in a social way of them, while at the, at, at the other, on the other side, um, um, People were not, uh, did not mingle into politics. Because Lukashenko said, I take care of you socially, but you please leave me alone with my politics and I will do that. So now he didn't take care anymore of the, of the people. And I think that was part of the reason that he lost uh, the elections in, 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 on the 9th of August last year. I think he lost uh, a number of percentage points just because of this uh, very reason. Second momentum uh, that led to deterioration of our relations was uh, the fact that uh, two 
the two probably most promising potential candidates to run in the elections were excluded from the, not only excluded from the race, but they were arrested under invented uh, reasons. First, of course, the longtime uh, head of the uh, Belarusian affiliate of Gazprom Bank, Mr. Babariko, and of course also the husband of Svetlana Tikhanovska, Sergei Tikhanovsky, um, and they were arrested in June under invented reasons. And then, of course, we had no OSC observation and uh, a lot of uh, fairy tales we were communicated to us already in the run-up to the elections. And then you have all seen what happened in the elections on 9th of August and afterwards. It was unfortunately uh, terrible. Uh, one interesting momentum is that uh, until the 9th of August, we were told by the authorities that the reason for the arrests of those candidates was that they were all Russian candidates, that Russia had promoted these candidates to be in the, in the, in the race in order to uh, endanger the independence of the country. And this was necessary in order to ensure the independence, we needed to, the Russia factor needed to be eliminated. From 9th of August, when we reacted strongly to the violence that uh, the regime authorities were applying against peaceful protesters, against peaceful people, suddenly it was again the old pattern applied again, namely the West is, it's all the West's fault and uh, that was all organized by us and suddenly we were the enemy again and Russia became again the big friend. That has continued until today and um, uh, that led to a further degradation of our relations. We introduced uh, uh, the first sanctions package in October last year, uh, following which uh, the first two ambassadors had to leave the country, namely the Polish and the Lithuanian ambassador from here. They left, uh, uh, in, had to leave in October. Uh, along with uh, part of their staff, uh, which was reduced. Um, then there were further uh, um, uh, uh, diplomats had to leave the country. The, the British uh, deputy head of mission and the British military attaché were, were basically extradited from the country. And uh, later on, uh, in May uh, this year, the Latvian ambassador had to leave following, maybe you know the story, the Ice Hockey World Championship, where in the uh, Ice Hockey, in the hall where the Ice Hockey the stadium uh, take place in front of this uh, stadium. Uh, the white, red, white flag was hissed and replaced uh, the green, red flag of uh, Lukashenko Belarus. Um, the next day, the uh, Latvian ambassador was asked to leave along with the whole mission of Latvia, basically. The next one was me uh, at the end of June uh, that I had to leave. Um, and uh, following that, uh, the rest of the Lithuanian mission was uh, asked to leave. Um, so there is uh, only one caretaker officer there and also the US mission was in two different uh, uh, acts uh, limited basically to a level which is now as low as it was in 2008, namely five US diplomats only are on the ground in, uh, in, in Minsk and you have no, um, you have no uh, ambassador. Uh, there was an ambassador nominee, Julie Fisher, and she is now working here. Maybe she has already been here, I don't know, but maybe you want to invite her, I'm sure she would come with pleasure as well. Uh, interesting uh, lady with whom I work very closely together. Um, and finally, the last one was the French ambassador colleague who was the only EU member states ambassador who uh, arrived in Minsk in Belarus after the fraudulent elections. So uh, obviously the big question was, uh, would he present his uh, letters of credential, that's the papers that you have to hand over when you are uh, nominated as ambassador from your own head of state. So would he hand them over to Lukashenko if he's asked? And of course we have an, a rule uh, that we have uh, fixed uh, internally that we would not do so. Any new EU member states ambassador would not uh, present credentials to Lukashenko because we do not recognize him any longer as president because we uh, consider these elections as fraudulent and uh, that is why uh, Lukashenko is no longer the president of, this, uh, of, of, of Belarus. So he was, uh, the French colleague was staying for a while, he was invited once to present the credentials to Lukashenko, he rejected. And then there was a second uh, round and uh, following uh, the, the moments around the second uh, round, he was asked to leave the country, I think a month or two ago. And uh, he is currently also here in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Vilnius, uh, working now as a special envoy of the French government on, on, on Belarus. So that's where we are. What measures have we taken as EU in reaction? We have uh, our Bible, if I may call it like this, in our relations now is the so-called uh, conclusions of the Foreign Affairs Council. Foreign Affairs Council is the meeting of all EU foreign ministers. They meet once per month. Um, and there was a meeting in October 2020 
And at this meeting, we decided um, uh, how we deal with, uh, with uh, Belarus in the future, namely the sanctions were concluded. And we also put there the conditions under which, or following which, these sanctions can be lifted again. And these conditions have not changed. They are still the same today. It's very easy, these, uh, sanction, these, these conditions. First, release all political prisoners. By the way, state of play today, we have almost 900 political prisoners in the country. Um, sorry? I know, I know, and five are even uh, uh, from, the, from European Humanities University, which is very, very sad. Um, so close to 900 political prisoners to be released unconditionally and without, and by closing all legal procedures that have been imposed against them, to stop the violence against peaceful people, that uh, this harassment uh, stops once and for all the, of peaceful people, um, to start a dialogue with the population. Lukashenko talks very often that uh, he wants to relaunch dialogue with the EU, with the West, with the US. That's not what is needed. What is needed is a dialogue with his own people. And that is what we always uh, say. Uh, if there is a dialogue with the people, we will also again talk to, to, to some people. Uh, so this is um, uh, the third condition. And the fourth is following this dialogue, the organization of new presidential elections properly organized and observed by the international organizations such as OSC Odier, as it is supposed to be. So this is the, the conditions under which we are, can consider the lifting of sanctions. Unfortunately, so far we have not seen a single reaction by the, by the authorities in this end, to this end. On the contrary, uh, as you know, daily there are more uh, political prisoners uh, added. There are a few that have been released simply because their term in jail finished. Uh, and uh, a handful has perhaps uh, been, uh, been, uh, been released, but obviously uh, the, the big players are all in jail. They have partially got incredibly big prison terms, as you, as you will know. Um, and we are expecting now, on the 14th of December, the trial against Sergei Tikhanovsky and also Mikolai uh, Statkiewicz, one of the old uh, opposition members. And they can expect uh, very high prison figures, uh, all invented, of course, uh, and we will, of course, uh, uh, defend uh, de them uh, strongly. What have we done on the ground as EU ambassadors for all this time? We have been very active and nobody can tell us from the regime that we have not warned them uh, against the behavior that they have shown. Already back in June uh, of 2020, we have sent a note to the authorities outlining what we would expect to, be, to happen in the elections. So how we want the elections to be run. Unfortunately, it has not uh, led to any, uh, to any result, uh, but we have uh, warned them. We had also a joint meeting, uh, the US Chargé d'Affaires at the time, uh, the British colleague and myself with Mr. McKay, in which we also outlined exactly what we expect from the authorities. Nothing has unfortunately uh, uh, helped. And, um, and afterwards, uh, once the violence uh, after the 9th of August elections has taken place, we have been also very active on the ground. We went, for instance, uh, uh, when the first person was killed, uh, which was on the 10th of August 2020, we went uh, the day after to the place where he was killed and we laid flowers there, all of us. And uh, we were received by a huge uh, group of people applauding us that we, that, uh, that we, would, uh, that we did so. And uh, that was, I think, a, a very nice gesture that we, that we did, uh, and the minimum we can do in these uh, circumstances. Also, uh, we defended Svetlana Alexeyevich, maybe, maybe you know. Uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich, in September last year, was under the threat of being, uh, of being arrested uh, as a member of the so-called Coordination Council that they have founded. So we went to her place, uh, to where she lived. She's a single lady, and, um, and, we, um, and we basically uh, stayed in her place. During the day, we were partially all of us, all EU ambassadors uh, present there. And during the night, there was always one female diplomat uh, who stayed overnight with her in order to prevent her from being arrested. And we managed that she was not arrested. Um, but uh, a few days later, she left the, the country because she didn't feel safe anymore. And since then, she is in Berlin, as you, as you will know, and is, uh, is working from there. Uh, soon her new book will be published. I met her two months ago in Berlin and she's writing on a new book and this will deal with the events. So I'm looking forward to seeing her new book and to, to reading it. Um, furthermore, we have been uh, to all, to, to most of the uh, court proceedings, so-called court proceedings, I should say, against political prisoners. Um, we went, uh, we always decided among us who would go. Some, uh, some colleagues went to attend these, uh, these uh, political prisoner court, court uh, 
uh, sessions, which were absurd, of course, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, until that was until June this year, and in June this year, the authorities decided to not allow us anymore and into the courtroom. They invented a new rule, and now we are not allowed to go into the courtroom, courtrooms anymore. I mean, there anyway, there are many of the court proceedings are now uh, behind closed doors, but even the open ones, the few open ones, we are not allowed to attend. So what do we do? We put ourselves in front of the courtroom, in front of the court building, if you want. And uh, we have done that in the past and also now uh, on the 14th of December when this next uh, court uh, ruling against Tichanowski and Zatkiewicz is to be expected. Uh, we will also go there, that's in Gommel. They moved that to Gommel to be far away from Minsk, but we will nevertheless, a group of diplomats from the West will go there and uh, position themselves in front of the courtroom. There, uh, we are usually harassed by the state propaganda media, by some telegram channels. Uh, one of the worst of the kind is Mr. Azarionok, maybe you know him. And uh, there are a number of others uh, who are harassing diplomats there. They're coming with their microphones, asking, pertinent questions two centimeters in front of you and uh, you cannot move basically, it's, it's, it's harassment. We have complained to no avail, of course. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs told us these are independent media, they do what they want. Well, what, uh, I will leave that uncommented. So uh, this is our actions. We also invite very often the relatives of political prisoners to join meetings of the EU ambassadors. This is very much appreciated because uh, uh, it is interesting for both sides because we are finding out things how these uh, how terribly bad uh, many of these political prisons have been treated and it's a little bit of comfort for the uh, for the relatives for the wives for the mothers for the uh, brothers uh, fathers of the political prisoners that we show uh, a little bit of care for them so we repeat this uh, quite often and it's always very much appreciated and we also do that we change we don't invite always the same because there's so many so that many uh, have the chance to meet uh, with us there on the ground and it's much appreciated we have also joined an initiative uh, that the US has started to make public uh, the, 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 the destinies of some of these political prisoners. Because many of us know the 20, 30, 40 very famous uh, political prisoners, but as I said, there are close to 900. And there are many of these political prisoners that uh, not many people know. People from the countryside, from the province, and we are trying to, to help them uh, as well by making their cases public. So uh, if you look, uh, for instance, at the Facebook page of the EU delegation in Minsk or at my own one, I always republish. Uh, there's once per week we have a new case that we publish of a very short uh, with a photo and uh, what he, is a, he or she is accused of and uh, with a demand that uh, the person should be released without delay in order to make known to the world also those cases which are not so known. So we are as active as, as possible uh, besides our sanctions uh, policy. As I said, we, are now, we have now published the fifth package. Our biggest package so far was the fourth package. Uh, the fourth package into ALIA concluded also the blocking of the airspace for uh, Belarusian Airlines to the European Union. This is a topic that can be discussed. It's not an easy topic because it also prevents, of course, normal Belarusians from traveling to, on a direct way to, to, from Minsk to, to the European Union. But we thought it was necessary following the forced landing of the Ryanair flight uh, on the 21st of May. You will all remember the case, Mr. Protasevich uh, on a plane from Athens to Vilnius. Basically, he was brought down, the plane was brought down, put many people into danger of life uh, by doing so. Um, and Protasevich and his uh, girlfriend, an EHU student, uh, was basically taken out of the plane and brought to, uh, to jail. And afterwards, uh, and we do not want to know what has happened to Mr. Protasevich, he uh, then suddenly spoke out in favor of Lukashenko after the, but obviously we cannot take this for serious. Uh, he has probably been tortured and we should not take this uh, too serious. Um, so that's the situation in which we are, unfortunately, five packages of sanctions, relations close to zero. There were only two areas with which uh, we have uh, engaged uh, still on working level with the authorities. One is nuclear energy. Uh, that is the famous uh, nuclear power plant in Ostrovets, not far away from the Lithuanian border, which is very much, of course, criticized by the Lithuanian uh, government uh, because of uh, uh, the closeness to the border, the, uh, the experience of Chernobyl just uh, 35 years ago uh, and of course because of the security standards which uh, uh, Lithuania believes are not kept. Uh, well, the good news is that they have been cooperative. It's maybe the only area where the authorities have been cooperative. 
maybe this uh, cooperation has been forced a little bit by the production company of the, uh, of the plant, which is uh, Rosatom. Uh, because Rosatom wants to build more power plants, wants to construct more power plants, and maybe they're interested to, uh, to have their image uh, in, a, in a good shape. And for that, of course, regular controls are needed and regular checkups by, by all the responsible authorities. So our expert team uh, was twice uh, in 2021 in, uh, in Osterowitz, and they got access to all what they wanted to see, and they were not unhappy about what they have uh, been seen. Obviously, uh, there's no guarantee from such uh, short visits that uh, everything will work fine. Uh, we will see what the future will, will bring. Second uh, topic is, of course, uh, migration related. Uh, so we have seen another escalation. After the Ryanair downing, a second step of escalation took place since June, basically, it started. First, uh, uh, migrants were brought in, facilitated by the regime, uh, into Belarus and brought to the Lithuanian border to here. This was the starting point. Lithuania was not prepared at all uh, because it has never happened before. Uh, that shows also that this is not a normal migration crisis, but a forced one. Uh, and it was not, uh, you know, it was not uh, a classic one where simply people decided to leave because there are much shorter ways to get to Europe than through Belarus, in, if you come from Iraq, from Syria, or from somewhere else. So um, we have seen this uh, migration crisis growing. First uh, Lithuania, then uh, Latvia and Poland, and now it's mainly Poland. Uh, not only, there are still also uh, migrants trying to cross into Lithuania, uh, but um, uh, mainly Poland. Uh, there was an escalation in the, in the past weeks, uh, following which then uh, still Chancellor Merkel uh, decided to call Lukashenko. Uh, some people think it was a mistake. Uh, I think uh, we will see if, she, if this helps to get the migrants back home then uh, maybe uh, it has at least had a, had, a, had a purpose. In any case, we have always said this is not uh, a legitimization of Lukashenko as president. It was simply uh, a call to sort out the humanitarian crisis. Following this call, um, uh, we sent uh, from the EU side two technical experts on humanitarian aid to Belarus to analyze the situation together with the international organizations dealing with humanitarian issues, UNHCR, and the International Organization for Migration and the International Red Cross. And um, so they were there simply to analyze the situation, in particular uh, regarding one warehouse near the Polish border where up to 1,200 migrants were, were put in. So uh, they came back with an analysis and we have made some limited funds available, but these funds are not given to the regime. These funds, altogether 700,000 euros, they are given to international organizations and they then will take care of humanitarian aid, direct aid to the migrants who are stranded under false promises in, in, in the country, in Belarus, in cold conditions, which they're not used to such, uh, such cold weather. Um, and uh, secondly, to help uh, uh, on a, for a temporary, to create a temporary accommodation place, and uh, the pronunciation is on temporary, because uh, they should not stay there for long. Uh, this is what the money is for. The third step that we are ready to support, but it's not the task of our humanitarian experts, is repatriation, repatriation of those migrants who want to return. It's a voluntary return. But we have the impression that quite many would want to return, and we have seen over the last days uh, altogether around 2,000 of the migrants having returned. We have no idea how many migrants there are uh, in, in, in Belarus, only Lukashenko knows, uh, but we do not think that it's more than 15,000 altogether, and probably by now uh, less. Uh, you should also see that uh, quite a few thousand have made it through the border into Europe and uh, I think in Germany they have now close to 10,000 already captured uh, migrants who have uh, arrived through the Polish border or through the Lithuanian border or the Latvian border in, in, into, into Germany. Um, the figures, to put things into perspective, are of course not so big as, uh, as they were uh, uh, in the big uh, migration crisis 2014-15 on the Turkish and, and Greece side. However, uh, uh, you have to consider that, of course, uh, it is totally new because nobody came, uh, hardly anybody came via Belarus in the past. So obviously, uh, the member states need to, to be prepared. We have offered as European Union our support. We are supporting all three countries. Uh, now, uh, I think all three want to build uh, a fence or even a wall. Uh, that is not our ideal idea, to be honest, because we wanted to create a Europe without borders. Um, but obviously, uh, my personal view is that there is, they have little other choice if they want to protect themselves from uh, entering many, many, many migrants. 
Um, so um, uh, probably this will happen. Part, part of the fences have already been constructed. The, it continues. We have seen absurd pictures where Belarusian uh, officials have given you know, big uh, instruments to cut the fences uh, to the migrants so that they could cut the just constructed fences and could uh, go through the hole. Uh, this has to stop, of course, and uh, we have told this very clearly to, to, the, to the regime and we hope that uh, there is a de-escalation now, but obviously we do not know how the reaction will be now on the fifth package which, of sanctions which has just been, been published. So our relations are obviously the, close, to, close to, to zero by now. These are the two areas, the only areas with which we have some limited conversation, on which we have some limited conversation. All our financial cooperation has been moved away from the authorities, so we don't pay any money anymore to the, to the public authorities, but we uh, move now to cooperation with civil society, with the people of Belarus. Uh, that is easier said than done. It is easy not to pay anything anymore to the authorities, but it's not easy to finance uh, to help those who are in need inside Belarus right now because the authorities are threatening everyone to, to make them responsible, to, 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 to arrest them. Uh, the other day the head of the Bird Watchers Club was arrested, Belarusian Bird Watchers Club, because he had received some fund by the EU. So you can imagine how far this, uh, this, uh, this harassment is, is going. Therefore, one has to be very careful in supporting uh, certain people. And of course, there are not many left also. Large part of civil society is either in jail or has left uh, the country. Uh, but there are still people who deserve our support and we're trying to do that. It's easier to support, of course, people outside of uh, Belarus. Uh, that we are doing. Uh, but of course, there are lots of people who have suffered from torture in jails and who have now been released maybe. Um, and uh, for the, these people are in need not only of physical help but also psychological help because they are often in, in very difficult conditions and they need, they need our help. So uh, one part of our, of our financial support is going into this direction and we're working closely with the European Endowment for Democracy. It's an NGO in, in, in Brussels uh, based which uh, helps uh, uh, in a relatively straightforward way without much bureaucracy in a, in a more unconventional way. Uh, and they can uh, support people uh, in, in a way that we cannot simply do. So we're working with them. They get a certain amount of our funds. Uh, and by the way, not only us, but many other, others do the same, the UK. Uh, and we're working with, 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 with them. Um, apart from this, we have uh, a number of priority areas. Uh, the one is the health sector, which has been not so easy because we want to help uh, overcome the COVID crisis or to, in, in Belarus as well, since the government doesn't do very much. Uh, we want to help, but it's not easy to do something without the government in the health sector because everything is state. Uh, but still, we have found some means. So far, our offers to, uh, to deliver a, a vaccina, Western vaccination, has been rejected. Uh, Lukashenko even said that Russian and Chinese uh, vaccina are better. Okay, uh, we have to take it, uh, as he says, but I think uh, if the conditions are right, they might, uh, they might be willing to, to take. There are some rumors that Lukashenko got vaccinated with, uh, with Western vaccine and not with, uh, and not with the Russian or Chinese, but we don't have any proof. Um, then another sector is the small and medium-sized enterprise sector. We see the state-run economy is uh, coming to the limits of their efficiency. Uh, there is, uh, it worked for a while, uh, relatively okay, until 10 years ago, but since then, unfortunately, we see the economy not uh, stagnating at best uh, and going down. Why? Because reforms need to take place in the, in, in the, in the, in the economy. Um, and uh, who can best contribute to this? Uh, our example in Western Europe shows small and medium-sized enterprises need support. And that's what we're trying to do. We're working with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and trying to give them direct support. Um, that is also one way. And of course, the education sector. That brings me also to the European Humanities University. We um, have, um, uh, first of all, increased our funding for the, for the EHU. Uh, so there will be uh, more funds available. And obviously, we also want to help making uh, the EHU fit for the future, for more students, possibly for a bigger responsibility, even than it's already now. Uh, so we are, we are trying to help uh, there a bit. And of course also to organize more, uh, more scholarships and stipends for Belarusian students in Western University in general in the European Union via our normal programs. Um, on the civil society side, we are trying to support independent media 
because uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, uh, almost all, basically all independent media have been closed down, including the most renowned and oldest ones. Uh, it's terrible really to see this. We have uh, about 30 journalists in jail as political prisoners that have been arrested from uh, very good uh, journalist uh, pieces such as uh, Tutbai, uh, for instance, uh, or, or many others. So uh, all of them unfortunately are, uh, are uh, closed and many of them are in jail or had to leave the country. Uh, Tutbai has now reinvented itself uh, and works from abroad. Zerkalo, maybe you have seen it. Uh, they are doing almost the same job as before and uh, are good, good publications. And so this, they, we want to help them and because, because of course we help human rights defenders. There is the most renowned human rights defenders organization, Vyasna. Uh, and there's unfortunately many of them are in jail. Among them, their super renowned head, Alex Bialyatsky, who is a star, basically. He, is, uh, he has my highest admiration, what he has been doing for all those years. Fantastic and not afraid. And he's again back in jail. He expected this, but he did not want to stop. He got many prizes when he was free and, uh, and even when he's in jail. And obviously, uh, they deserve our big support, the same as uh, groups like Helsinki Committee. Uh, and other human rights defenders, so they are also get our support uh, as much as possible. So maybe one word on the Eastern Partnership Summit that is upcoming. Uh, we have soon the Eastern Partnership Summit on the 15th of December in Brussels, and uh, it will not be a surprise to you that Belarus will not be uh, participating because uh, the official authorities have suspended the membership in the uh, in, have suspended their membership in the Eastern Partnership. Uh, and uh, after some discussions, we have decided to leave the chair of Belarus empty when the other heads of state will be coming, um, meaning Zelensky and Maya Sandu from Moldova and uh, the Georgian president, etc. So the Belarusian chair will be empty, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that Belarus, for us, has left the Eastern Partnership. We have always said, for us, it is the government, the authorities that have left that have suspended their membership, but the people of Belarus and Belarus as a country continues to be part of the Eastern Partnership. We will organize also an event in the margins of the Eastern Partnership Summit to which we invite some leaders of the democratic forces um, and we will have discussions on very high level. Uh, the details are currently in the planning, but you will soon uh, read that, I'm sure, in the, in the news uh, uh, about this uh, as well. There have been also some attempts to reach out to the authorities. Uh, uh, Austrian government organized uh, or, or wanted to organize a conference uh, a few weeks, a few days ago uh, in Vienna. Uh, that is actually coming back to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's idea to organize such a gathering and maybe try to engage the authorities in some kind of dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, they failed because the authorities uh, rejected the idea and did not want to participate. Uh, we had further heard that at least maybe someone from the so-called Minsk Dialogue would take part. Maybe some of you know the Minsk Dialogue. It's a, what we call a gongo, a government, uh, non-governmental organization. It's not an independent organization. It's basically uh, supporting Lukashenko. Uh, but even these uh, think tankers, uh, pro-Lukashenko think tankers, were not allowed to, to participate in the end. Uh, and then COVID came uh, in, a, in, a, in a tougher version. Uh, Austria was, uh, had a lockdown and then the conference had to be put into, into a virtual uh, uh, modus, uh, mode and uh, in the end it was uh, of course a much smaller event than, we, than, we, than, than it was supposed to be. But to cut a long story short, we could not succeed in uh, convincing the, um, the government to take part in this to launch a certain first dialogue uh, with the authorities. Uh, constitutional reform, one word, uh, there's a constitutional reform ongoing and there are two groups who are preparing a new concept. First there's Svetlana Tikhanovska and her team, uh, namely uh, Anatoly Lebyatko, uh, a renowned member of the old opposition, if I may call it like this. He's the chair of this constitutional reform team. We have provided him support in terms of uh, access to the experts of the Council of Europe on constitutional uh, reforms. And uh, there was, uh, in the margins of this Vienna conference, there was a day before, just the day before the lockdown entered into place, uh, there was a conference that took physically place on the constitutional reform uh, with many experts and, uh, this, uh, and the Lebietko team has actually a quite good new draft version ready, which then needs to be analyzed by the de in detail by the experts of the, of the Council of Europe. At the same time, Lukashenko's people have also prepared a constitutional reform. The first draft of this reform was public. We could see it still, maybe some of you have seen it. 
It was uh, actually not as bad as I feared, but it was also killed right away by Lukashenko. Lukashenko said immediately it's not good. And then there were several new versions, but none of them was made public anymore. So we don't know it, uh, where, where we stand. Uh, in any case, uh, this version by the Lukashenko people has not been consulted with many others, n not with the people, not with civil society. So uh, uh, definitely it's not, uh, not the way how one should, should do this. Um, so what for the future, perhaps one word still, uh, what will the future bring? Obviously, it's very difficult to be optimistic right now, and you see the situation. Uh, but we all hope, of course, for changes. We all hope that the regime will come to its senses, whether Lukashenko will still come to its senses. I have some doubts, to be, to be honest. Uh, but uh, we can always hope that this will happen. Uh, we have, um, you know, um, uh, there is, uh, of course, different scenarios uh, which we envisage. Uh, one scenario is, of course, also increased Russian influence. We have not uh, talked about uh, Russia so far. Um, uh, Russia, of course, uh, has got much more influence. In fact, all was hap what happened so far is in the interest of the Kremlin. Uh, the Kremlin got much more uh, hold of Lukashenko. Lukashenko has become weaker. He needs the money from Russia because we don't pay anything anymore. All is playing to the Russian tune. In the short term, will it be in the long term in the interest to have uh, such a rogue state in between Russia and the uh, European Union? I doubt it. So we have to see what, what happens on that, uh, on that front. Um, so uh, that is one factor that Russia increases influence, that uh, Belarus will get totally dependent uh, and maybe will be also factually taken over. I don't think that, we'll, that, we can, that, that they will you know, uh, include Belarusian territory into Russia. I think they know that the reaction would be terrible from the world community. But uh, it is enough if they factually control uh, everything, uh, politics, uh, economy and others. Uh, there's not more needed. And that such risk, uh, of course, exists. That is uh, no doubt. Uh, another option is that uh, it continues like this. Uh, Lukashenko stays in power, survives somehow. The Russians are paying just as not enough that he stay, keeps his head over the water. Possible. Uh, what I can assure you is that we will not uh, lift our sanctions before our conditions are not fulfilled. So that means also that we uh, will also work on further sanctions if the situation continues to deteriorate. We are not afraid of this. It's a possibility. Um, but um, we have still some hopes. Who could change the situation uh, in Belarus? I'm afraid the European Union, very difficult. I mean, we are not uh, on the front line there. Um, and we do not want to do this as well. It's uh, for the Belarusian people to decide this. Uh, Belarusian people in the first place. Um, can we imagine at this moment that uh, we have hundreds of thousands of people coming to the street again? I guess you will agree with me that this is very difficult to imagine. But I think also that a little spark, something, some mistake that uh, the regime makes and maybe people will be so annoyed that they will take back to the streets even against the risk, even by being afraid. Uh, so I wouldn't totally exclude it even though it doesn't look very likely today. Second option, is it possible that somebody from the top will say we have enough, a group of people around Lukashenko and saying we have enough of this guy, he only isolates us, we want to have a normal life, we want to uh, uh, create Belarus uh, in, in a positive way. Possible, but at this moment also very unlikely because he has replaced a lot of specialists by loyalists, by people from the security forces who are simply known to be loyal to Lukashenko. Uh, and not necessarily know the subject matter very well. So also uh, not so easy to imagine right now. And then the third factor, Russia. Russia, of course, has the possibility if it wants. Would I do that if I was uh, Putin right now? I don't know, because the same could happen in Russia as well to him. So um, it is, uh, but Russia would have the potential, of course, uh, of, of influencing uh, uh, Lukashenko to such a degree that uh, he could uh, step down. We have not seen this so far, but uh, who knows what the, what the future brings. So we will make our uh, further policy dependent on the reaction by the regime, in particular whether finally a reform process will start it, a reform process will be started, whether all the conditions that I mentioned before will be fulfilled. And for that reason then we have, if this happens, if we have a democratic process under, underway, we are ready to spend uh, 3 billion euros as a start-up uh, fund, so to speak, for such economic reforms uh, to, be, uh, to be launched. But uh, this remains in the safe so far, this money, and will only be taken out if and when uh, democratic reforms will be started. We hope that we can make use of this money very soon, because it would be in all our interest to have a stable and predictable neighbor in, to the European Union, which, we, which is in our interest. So that is also why we cannot compare the situation 
uh, in Belarus with Venezuela or with, uh, with Myanmar. Or These are not direct neighbors. The situation is also important there, but it's not, uh, has not such a direct impact as the migration crisis uh, shows on the European Union directly. I think I will stop here and I will give you the chance to ask me questions or to, or to challenge my, my <laughs> comments as you wish. I hope it was interesting for you and now I'm all yours. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those who are watching our broadcasting online, so this is the floor for your questions and probably I could start uh, with a question that Mr. Thank Ambassador you. has mentioned already. Uh, what do you think that the uh, European sanctions really hurt Lukashenko regime? Uh, just because there are kind of rumors, let's say, that Lukashenko doesn't pay attention uh, directly to the sanctions and it kind of stimulate, uh, stimulation for his aggression towards the uh, Belarusian nations, probably. What is your opinion, probably maybe your personal opinion or as a European Union representative opinion about the role of the sanctions mm -hmm. toward the aggressiveness of the Belarusian regime? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. It's a very pertinent question that we get a lot, of course. Uh, the first thing to say is that uh, it is not easy, we don't take it easy to impose sanctions. Um, it is not our favorite means, but it's the only means we have to express our disagreement and our opposition to measures that are taken in a, in a given country where there are clear violations of the international, uh, legisl international law and, uh, and, and, and human rights. So this is the way we have. We will not go to war, <laughs> you know. Uh, that is why the means that we have is to impose sanctions and we're trying, when we set up a pack of sanctions, we are trying to be very careful. Why do, many people have said, oh, it takes so long, the European Union, until they get their packages together. Why? Because it has to be very carefully analyzed uh, what sanctions we can impose. We're trying to impose sanctions which are really hitting those that it's supposed to hit, the persons and also the companies and the structures. And we're trying to minimize, to minimize the impact on um, on the people, on the normal people, as much as possible. You will agree that it's, uh, of course, not, uh, not always possible. If you, imp if you impose sanctions on a company, there are, of course, normal workers who de facto have nothing to do with the, uh, the decisions of the management of this company or of the leadership. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, that is sometimes unavoidable, but we are trying to minimize it as much uh, as possible. Um, we have also to be careful that, uh, because we have a very strict democratic uh, checks and balances system, so uh, many of those who, uh, against whom we have imposed sanctions, they go to the court uh, and challenge these uh, sanctions. And um, uh, the example of Ukraine uh, shows, uh, for instance, uh, we had imposed sanctions against a number of uh, uh, collaborators of uh, Yanukovych and his, uh, uh, his leadership at the time, and uh, including Yanukovych himself. Um, and many of those went to court and many of those won their cases. Why? Because we didn't have enough proof, uh, even though we knew that uh, they did wrong things. But the Ukrainian authorities did not provide us with enough uh, uh, substantiated proof to win these uh, court uh, rulings, so we lost. And then uh, sometimes this includes also payments that have to be made against those who have been erroneously put on the sanctions list. So, uh, and that is of course uh, European taxpayers' money, so we have to be very careful uh, before we do so in order to make sure that they cannot uh, challenge us, that the accusations are properly proven that we have against certain, certain players. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, there are students, maybe some que questions from the room. Uh, so, we received a question online from the YouTube. Ambassador Shube, why Svetlana Tikhanovska won't represent Belarus at the Eastern Partnership Summit? Uh, the question from Alexandra. Mm -hmm. uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, um, uh, we, we believe that Svetlana Tikhanovska won the presidential elections, but we have no detailed proof of this, unfortunately. Why? Because the authorities have quickly destroyed all proof uh, after the elections. And we have always said that we need uh, new, properly observed elections in order to define who has won uh, these elections. We are practically sure that Svetlana had uh, the absolute majority, but we have no proof of this. Uh, the, the regime, unfortunately, uh, made, made their best. So if we were to allow Svetlana to sit there, we would, in a way, uh, in, uh, speak against our own uh, rules that we have, our own, uh, that we have set up, that we need new elections uh, properly observed 
and then she can take part and I'm sure she, uh, if the same composition would be again taking place then she would uh, most likely win and then she would also be able to represent the country. Thank you, I hope the question of Alexandra was answered already. Dear colleagues, so probably I could proceed with the uh, following questions about the referendum. Uh, which are planning by the Belarusian authorities. What is the vision of the European Union on this referendum and how do you think about the role of this referendum into the prospective Belarusian future probably? As you have mentioned uh, before, the uh, kind of constitution changes also was provided by the Belarusian authorities. But the role of referendum, how do you think, what is the role of uh, this process uh, into the building of the new Belarusian probably? Well, a referendum in a, in a democratic country is a very good tool to, to, to find out what people think about a certain subject. Um, our neighbors of the European Union from Switzerland are doing a lot of referenda, as if you follow this. Uh, it's really the people who decide in this country. It is sometimes, I find it good, sometimes less, because sometimes there are subjects which perhaps not everybody knows about in detail. And then to judge, uh, to, 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 to judge uh, by, to, to make some people vote who do not know the subject is of course questionable. But uh, so in principle referendum is a good thing, uh, but uh, this should be properly prepared. And uh, if you put a legal piece, a draft uh, piece of legislation for a referendum, this has to be discussed before with the broadest possible part of the society. And uh, in, in Europe, such referenda take a lot of time to prepare. Uh, to, I remember the um, referendum on the independence of Scotland out of the, uh, in the UK, the last one that uh, failed, um, um, uh, took, uh, I don't know, one and a half years or two years to prepare. And uh, the same should be also valid for, for this uh, referendum. And uh, first of all, we do not see any broad public participation. Uh, what Lukashenko claims uh, this broad participation consists of 20 or 30 uh, allies of the regime. So we cannot speak about a broad uh, participation. And that is why I think the referendum per se uh, cannot be objective and cannot be good. But we have to see how this will be run, also whether there is proper observation by international organizations. You know, international organizations do not look, do not look only on election day or on the voting day or, the, or how it is counted, but also on the period before uh, how, what has happened. And uh, so it is too early to say something more detailed now, but uh, the starting uh, part is not good already. Thank you. Questions? Four. Don't hesitate. Yes, sure. If you have a question in Russian, if you have a question in Russian, if you have a question in Russian, you can ask the Russian language, and the Russian language will answer you in Russian. Пожалуйста, представьтесь, и мы предложим вам микрофон. Меня зовут Алекс, я студент первого курса медиа и коммуникации. У меня есть вопрос. Наш профессор Мельников однажды сказал, что когда смотрел интервью одного экономиста, тот заявил, что уровень экспорта в Беларуси за последние два года увеличился, и что при таком раскладе бюджета хватит и без поддержки России, и без поддержки Путина, Лукашенко на еще несколько лет. Что вы будете тогда делать в таком случае? Как вы будете поддерживать нашу страну и будете, что вы будете вообще предпринимать? Я отвечу на английском, если я могу, да? Если вы не против. Um, I think uh, the first thing to say is that um, in the West there are sometimes some uh, wrong uh, assumptions about the bad state of the economy. I think there's a, lot of, a little bit of wishful thinking. I also see this here in Lithuanian media or in others that the country would uh, you know, fall apart very quickly. That is not the case. Uh, I think if you look at in independent uh, think tanks, there is a very good think tank uh, I recommend you. You can uh, read it. It's called Berlin Economics. It's a German think tank close to the government, but they're doing independent analyses. And you will see, will see that um, the economic situation in the country is not so bad yet. A, because our sanctions are directed at the midterm, not at the short term. So we expect that our sanctions possibly only have a bigger effect next year or even in two years' time and not right now. The sanctions are also not uh, there to bring the country totally down. It's not the idea. The idea is to give warning signs and then to hope that there will be a positive reaction on these uh, signs. Um, the economy, as I said before, has lived, um, has, has, 
Lukashenko, I think, made the best out of this planned economy that, uh, that, uh, and the state economy that uh, is still running in Belarus until about 2010. I think that was about the highlight of uh, economic development. And since then, stagnation or going down uh, even. Um, that means in this system, without reforms, there will be no further progress. Uh, I think everybody understands this except for Lukashenko himself. Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, of course, reforms need to be uh, undertaken. We are ready to support these reforms if they were undertaken by a proper uh, leader, uh, which the country doesn't have right now. But as I said, we are trying to support, for instance, the small and medium-sized enterprise sector as much as we can uh, and to help. What we will not do, we will not support the regime as such in this current form. Before, new, before not all our conditions are fulfilled, there will be no money anymore flowing to, 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 to Belarus, to the, official, to the official authorities. Russia, as I said before, <coughs> Russia will help. Um, and Russia will probably, I don't know what they will do, but if you see the latest uh, one and a half years, Russia gives exactly as much money as is needed to repay credit installments to Russians, that, uh, that uh, Belarus owes to Russia, and maybe a little bit more, but not much more. So um, it shows that Russia is not going to flood uh, Belarus with a lot of money. Uh, that has to come from elsewhere. Uh, China has not uh, done anything. On the contrary, they have reduced their, their activities in Belarus. Why? Because they saw, or they are seeing Belarus as a springboard to the European Union as a springboard to be active, uh, to, to, to interact with European Union countries. If the European Union has no relations with Belarus, then China has no interest anymore to, to do much in, in Belarus. Um, so um, um, I, I, I think that um, the economic development as such, as I said, it's not going down the drain immediately, but of course there's a trend which is going downwards now. Uh, but I think the country can survive quite a bit uh, still, a few years. Uh, unless uh, we impose further sanctions that have uh, a more dramatic effect uh, or others impose such sanctions, the US for instance, and uh, unless Russia does not help anymore. But my gut feeling is that Russia is, that Belarus is the last country that uh, Russia will not help. It is the closest ally and they will always help them to stay uh, afloat, as le at least for the foreseeable future. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Конечно. Мне очень приятно, что сегодня была затронута тема России, поскольку я являюсь гражданином России. И вы знаете, что? Ага. Вы знаете, для меня также очень важной темой является тот факт об обнародованных пытках в тюрьмах России, если вы что-то знаете об этом, их обнародовал бывший заключенный Сергей Савельев, который на данный момент, если я не ошибаюсь, получил политическое убежище во Франции. Это отвратительно, ужасно. 40 гигабайт пыток в различных тюрьмах России, что свидетельствует о том, что режим в моей стране больше закручивает гайки, он становится более бесчеловечным, и это было заметно уже давно. Ваше мнение по этому вопросу, будет ли новый виток санкций вследствие данной ситуации? Второй вопрос, обострение российско-украинских отношений. Через СМИ просачивается информация, что на границе сейчас происходят новые возможные конфликтные столкновения, между российскими и украинскими солдатами. И меня тоже это беспокоит, поскольку я не скрываю, что занимаю проукраинскую позицию в этом вопросе. Я за целостность Украины, пускай я и гражданин России, и я также выступаю и за Европу, и за европейский мир. Прошу вас по возможности и по-английски, если вы хотите ответить на мои вопросы. Спасибо. Спасибо вам большое. You know, we have one eternal rule, uh, and which is uh, you have to stick to what your, what your responsibility is. And I'm the ambassador to Belarus of the European Union, so I cannot uh, tell very much about it. Although I have been before dealing with Russia, so I know very well what you're talking about. I find it terrible. I followed this very closely. 
And I very much hope that uh, many uh, of those who have committed these crimes, because these are crimes, that they will be brought to responsibility. But uh, unfortunately, we're seeing in uh, Putin's Russia today that Putin is following Lukashenko uh, in, in his actions against uh, independent uh, uh, people against uh, human rights defenders, against civil society as a whole. So I'm not very optimistic, to be very honest, but I very much hope that uh, they will be, all those people who have committed these crimes in prisons worldwide, in, in, across Russia, that they will be brought to responsibility. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, it's the same, it's also not my responsibility, but I will tell you simply that we are observing the situation very carefully, what is happening there. We are very worried that uh, Russia has again amassing uh, troops there. Um, and um, we very much hope that uh, what we're seeing in Belarus now, the migration saga and all of this, that this is not uh, only serves the purpose to deviate attention from what is happening in the Donbass or near the Donbass uh, uh, on the Russian side. Uh, and uh, we very much hope that uh, nobody will be so crazy on the Russian side to, to, to think about moving into Ukraine. They have already, as you know. Um, so that's the only thing I want to say about this. Please understand, it's not my job right now. So. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Pleasure. Any other questions? Yes, please. Here or here? Could you please give us a mic drop? The question is over here. Hello. Uh, my name is Alexandra. And the question is in Russian. А сейчас по всему миру разбросаны живут большое количество студентов, которые не могут вернуться в Беларусь из-за репрессий, из-за того, что они были исключены из университетов. И была такая стипендия ЕУФ Беларусь. Большое количество студентов, которые действительно достойны этой стипендии, действительно находятся в тяжелом состоянии, в принципе, по жизни, они не прошли даже во второй тур этой стипендии. Будут ли какие-то еще подобные активности и какие-то возможности для студентов, которые находятся в таком положении? Спасибо. So you didn't re uh, achieve, you, you didn't get, they did, the students didn't get their stipends here or in, 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 in Belarus? So the students who are currently in the European Union, but they are Belarusian citizens. They didn't get their stipends here? Yes, it is. So as we correctly understand, they didn't pass the second round of the stipends, so that's mm -hmm. why they didn't receive this kind of support. Well, look, this is a difficult question that I cannot answer. Uh, like, uh, we need to look into the cases, uh, of course, uh, and uh, it depends also what stipends they got, whether this is Erasmus Mundus, uh, like a European stipendium, or whether it is a national stipendium from, uh, from one of the EU member states. Uh, so then, of course, you would, uh, they would have to direct themselves to the national authorities. Uh, but it's very difficult to answer like this. What I can tell you in general terms is that we are trying to increase the number of students, in particular from Belarus, for the future, who can receive uh, stipends such as uh, Erasmus Mundus Plus uh, or, uh, or Marie Curie and these kind of types of, 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 of stipends. But for the specific case, I really am I'm sorry, I, I, we need to look at the cases. I, mean, I, don't, I cannot reply to this. Why? What happened? Okay, Ambassador. More que questions from the room? Or even we have another one questions from YouTube channel from Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra asks us, uh, and how do you find the speech of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya in the European Parliament? What was the effect of the speech from your point of view? Yeah, first, uh, first you have to say that first, the speech was great. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very good speech that she gave and I recommend you all to listen to it. It's uh, half an hour, but uh, it's uh, really worthwhile. Um, it addresses uh, the whole situation and I, under and I share 99% uh, of what she says. Um, and um, uh, the European Parliament is exactly the right place uh, for having such speech because the European Parliament is the front runner, if you want, in supporting also the democratic forces in Belarus for all those years, by the way. Uh, Anatoly Libertko and the, uh, the old uh, opposition, if I may call it like this, uh, they have been regularly uh, received uh, in, in, in Brussels. Uh, they have been part of the European, as observers of the European People's Party Group, Christian Democratic Party Group in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, and, uh, and they continue this now, this support. So you could see when she comes into the room how much applause she got when she took the floor. Uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's a sign that uh, she is very respected. Um, and, uh, and her speech was uh, very, very good. 
Um, and of course it, it reaches a broad auditorium because it reaches the whole of Europe at the same time because the parliamentarians are coming from all 27 EU member states. So um, I think it was a, a very good speech um, and uh, uh, she set the, the level very high for such speeches. It will be difficult to, to beat, I think. Dear colleagues, more questions? Uh, we have 10 more minutes for a discussion and if we will receive some questions from the room, it will be good to ask Mr. Ambassador. So, uh, anyway, I have one more question. Uh, is not, uh, not so practical and political, but more philosophical. So, as you mentioned, uh, the role of the education is uh, pretty high. And what do you think about the role of uh, humanitarian education? Uh, as we may know, probably the crisis that happened in Belarus also was caused uh, also by the lack of the humanitarian preparation for the uh, students, for the high school people. People. So, what is your vision on the role of humanitarian education? I, mean, uh, I think it should be, uh, in, in, in Europe this is part of every, uh, uh, almost every subject of education that you have part of, you have also humanitarian education. I think it belongs to the, and even at schools it starts already, not only in universities. And uh, I think this should be part also, uh, I think a number of catastrophes could probably be avoided if, uh, if uh, every pupil in, in the world would be taught uh, humanitarian, would receive humanitarian education as well. So uh, I think it's, um, there is, of course, uh, even in Russia or in, 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 in Belarus, there has been some kind of humanitarian education, but it's different from the one that we are. It is uh, linked to patriotism, to the eternal memory of, uh, of uh, the uh, great patriotic war and, uh, or the, the World War II, as we, as we of course, call it. Um, and um, it's, it's a different kind of humanitarian um, um, education. Uh, I think that this should, of course, not be forgotten. Nobody says this. Uh, I have, uh, it's, it's, it's very important. It also reminds people that uh, war should never be a means to solve any problems that you have. But I feel um, that this uh, should be much more in the focus uh, uh, in, in, in universities, uh, in, in, in the countries of the former Soviet Union, than it is until now. I think we have that in our curricula from quite early on. My, I can tell you, I have, my daughter is 12 and uh, she has that, she starts with that already now uh, in school. Uh, in, they have some special lessons also and it starts and, and that is how it should be. I was... Well-grounded preparation yeah. in the humanitarian fields. Yeah. Dear colleagues, one more question from the room or maybe from YouTube. Yeah, sure. The second year, which is international law and law of the European Union. So, Mr. Shubal, how did you assess the fact that two years ago you were nominated to be responsible for relations between the European Union and Belarus? And do you think you have managed to cope with the tasks? Thank you. <laughs> uh, apparently, I have coped with them very badly. Otherwise, I would probably be still there. No, I'm joking. Uh, um, I think, uh, first of all, I was not uh, responsible for Belarus. Well, I'm not responsible only since 2019. Between 2013 and 2018, I was responsible in Brussels for all six Eastern Partnership countries, including Belarus. I was many times here as well, uh, or in, 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 in Minsk as well. Uh, during that time, and um, I've seen the developments, uh, ups and downs, you know. Uh, but since I was nominated there, as I said, I think, uh, frankly speaking, I think uh, we, and I'm not only talking about me, but we, European Union uh, member states, and also the colleagues, ambassadors uh, with me there, we have done a lot of things right, uh, because we have, uh, as I told you before, we have reacted to each uh, development uh, immediately on the ground. We have warned the regime also against taking some steps uh, and uh, we have also afterwards uh, shown solidarity to those uh, Belarusian people that deserve solidarity. Uh, I think one of the reasons why I had to leave, uh, why the regime asked me to leave, is exactly that I showed this solidarity actively and uh, that we have, uh, that I stick, that I, that I stick to my principles or to our principles, to our values that the European Union has. 
Um, and uh, so that is, I think, uh, uh, very important that we that we work, that we respect our values for the re which is the basis for you know the European Union. And um, in, I can also tell you that our position has not changed. It was the same vis-à-vis -vis Belarus in 2005, in 2010, in 2015, and now. Nothing has changed. Uh, our position remains the same. Human rights need to be respected and democratic values. And uh, then we are ready to cooperate with the regime. And why did we have uh, such difficult periods in the past? Because uh, human rights were specifically violated. Uh, elections were falsified. People were beaten up and put to jail, but never to the degree as it has happened now. I want to give you one example. In uh, 2011, following the December 2010 falsified presidential elections, um, we, the Vyasna, the Human Rights Defender Organization, counted 29 political prisoners. Now we have close to 900. Can you imagine the difference? It's a huge difference, just only the numbers of political prisoners. More than 36,000 people have been put in jail since August last year. They, many of them are released, but often, many of them have been tortured also in, the, in this time, even if they got only 15 days in jail. So I think the most important thing that I consider the most important for my job is to stick to the values that I am asked to represent. Uh, I'm uh, representing the European Union uh, in Belarus and we have values and these values is important to defend them and to, and to mention this when they are not respected. That doesn't mean that we don't want to develop relations. We want, but only if uh, certain minimum values are respected. Unfortunately, that's not the case right now. So we have five more minutes for the uh, question and answer panels and uh, we are ready to probably answer for one more question and probably we'll finish our today's discussion with uh, His Excellency Ambassador, colleagues. There's one more. Yes, please. <coughs> Um, so you've said something about uh, like um, the thing that uh, Belarus might actually be under control of Russia. But uh, I have a question: Is there anything that makes you think that it hasn't already become? The reason why I'm concerned of the opposite is because, well, Lukashenko is constantly making some sort of uh, uh, diplomatic, like uh, uh, you know, uh, claims that, uh, he, that that you know that uh, they constantly they sign things about know, economical like uh, cooperation with Russia and well. He refers to Putin a lot of his like uh, political claims, and that what makes you think the opposite. And I wonder if your like if your opinion is different from mine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, good question. And uh, obviously, Russia already by now uh, is very influential in Belarus. I think this we can say. It has a lot of a lot of influence uh, on the political situation. It has a lot of influence on the economy. Uh, there is, of course, all the oil and gas that uh, is. Uh, going through Belarus that is refined in refineries is coming from Russia. If this would not come anymore, it would be also very difficult to survive. Uh, the potash sector uh, is also partially controlled by, by Russia. Many other parts of the economy are strictly linked. Bankings, uh, bank, banks are linked, Gazprom Bank uh, I mentioned before. Uh, the cultural sector, of course, as well, because a lot of culture is also Russian culture. There is also an own Belarusian culture, no doubt. Uh, but um, so there's a lot of uh, similarities which uh, makes the influence of Russia of course bigger. However, uh, so far Belarus is an independent country. It has a, an own national bank, it has an own currency, it has a, a own border guards, etc. Uh, you might know that in the framework of the Union Treaty negotiations between Russia and Belarus, uh, Russia wanted to propose, to, uh, or one of the issues discussed was a, a, a single currency for both, uh, to introduce the Russian ruble as a currency also in, in Belarus. And uh, from what we have been told, the Belarusian authorities said, okay, we can think about this, but then uh, we need an, an emission right as well. We need to be able to emit, to print, also in Minsk dollars, uh, rubles, Russian rubles, and not only in Moscow. And Russia said, no, 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 it will only be Moscow. Well, it's just one example, but what, what do you think what will happen if only Moscow has the right to to emit a new uh, currency, then it's the end of the monetary independence of, uh, of Belarus. So um, what I want to say is it can get worse. It, uh, the influence can get bigger still than it is. Military as well. So far there are no big, uh, you know, 
troops uh, in, in uh, no larger amount of troops uh, of Russian troops in, 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 in Belarus. Uh, we know that Russia would like to have a, a big uh, you know conting, contingent of Russian troops near the Polish border or near the Lithuanian border. And so far, Lukashenko has not agreed to, to this because he understands very well that this is also meaning uh, a diminution of the independence of the country. So uh, yes, there is a lot of dependence already, but um, uh, you know uh, it could get worse. It could uh, lead to a de facto loss of independence by uh, future if, if Russia influences has more influence. Ambassador of Pozes, really fruitful discussions. All of us today, uh, not in front of, but, but probably in sight of the not the easiest time for our country and our region at all. And a large number of students in this room uh, were supported by the consolidated uh, solidarity of the European Union and Nordic countries also. So we are grateful for this opportunity for our students, for our community to have the discussion for, with you today and thank you for visiting us and uh, it was pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much and uh, let me uh, also conclude by saying that it was a pleasure to be here to discuss with you very intelligent questions. Happy to come back, uh, uh, of course, and I hope it will not take two years again uh, and, and it will be a bit earlier. And um, um, please do also not hesitate if you have any questions to ask to the delegation, you can ask them on the website, on the Facebook site, uh, ask these questions, you will always get a, an answer. Uh, also on students' st stipends and whatever questions you, you may have. And uh, having said this, I wish you all the best of luck for your studies. Study hard, because uh, only with a, with a good result of your studies, you will also have the possibility to, to, have, uh, to, to, to get your dream job after, after the studies. So best of luck and Jive Belarus. Jive.